Hello and welcome to this session on GYN pathology catered toward pathology residents. Today we're going to be talking about basic GYN pathology of the endometrium and it's important to understand the basic histology of the endometrium in order to understand pathology. So if you haven't yet, please check out the prior videos on basic GYN histology, which I'm including a link to in the description below. Now, carcinogenesis in the endometrium is complex and involves many potential pathways. However, our basic understanding of the pathway for low-grade endometrioid type adenocarcinomas uh, is highlighted here. And the basic paradigm is you have unopposed estrogenic effect on the endometrium, leading to an uncontrolled proliferation of endometrial glands, and eventually clonal proliferation develops and leads to endometrioid adenocarcinoma. A few examples of potential causes of unopposed estrogenic effect are listed here. Over time, there have been various ways to describe events along this progression. And here I have terminology from the latest edition of the WHO, and this is terminology used in the majority of pathology departments as well. First, you have endometrial hyperplasia without atypia. This is describing the effect of unopposed estrogen on the endometrium. Then you have the development of clonal proliferation, which there are two different terms accepted by the WHO, atypical hyperplasia and endometrioid intraepithelial neoplasia. Although these terms attempt to describe the same process, they're defined in slightly different ways, which I'll get into in a little bit. And then you have endometrioid adenocarcinoma. Keep in mind that other terms have been used in the past, so you may see things like simple or complex hyperplasia. These terms are not really used anymore, so they should be dropping out of use. First, we'll talk about endometrial hyperplasia without atypia. And the basic definition here is a proliferation of endometrial glands such that the area of glands is greater than the area of endometrial stroma in a given area. And if you look at my very rudimentary diagrams at the bottom of the screen, you have blue in the background representing endometrial stroma, and you have red circles which represent endometrial glands. And if you add up all the area from the red circles and all the area from the blue in the background, if you have red outnumbering blue, then you have endometrial hyperplasia. The exact ratio here, it does vary somewhat depending on the source you use. So you'll see some sources that say your gland to stroma ratio should be greater than 3.1 for hyperplasia. You should check in with the attendings at your institution and see what threshold is used there because the threshold does vary slightly by personal preference and experience. So get used to what is used there and eventually you'll develop your own threshold. Here are some real life examples. So on the left hand side of your screen, you have endometrial hyperplasia and you can see just at low power here, there are a high density of endometrial glands here. You can definitely see that if you add up the area of those glands, it's gonna outnumber the stroma in that area. And if you look at the proliferative endometrium on the left, you can see just at low power without having to do much mental calculation that there's more stroma there than there are glands. So that's an okay ratio. At higher power in the areas of hyperplasia, you can see that there is a variable appearance of glands. So sometimes you have a very uniform proliferation of glands where the glands basically all look the same. But it is also common to have varying shapes, varying sizes of glands. Either way, it doesn't really matter. What matters is, again, that area of glands compared to stroma. And in summary, the key here is that Although hyperplastic, this proliferation lacks cytologic atypia. So if you look at each gland at higher power, it resembles essentially proliferative endometrium, so pseudostratified nuclei and some mitoses there, but no atypia. Usually there's an increased amount of endometrial tissue overall, and usually this is a diffuse process. So there's hyperplasia throughout the endometrium, and this is because that estrogenic effect is hitting the whole endometrium typically. Most of the time, this resolves and does not progress to carcinoma, and it's managed conservatively with progestin therapy. There are, of course, a few pitfalls we should talk about here that you should avoid. First off, uh, secretory endometrium. So remember, secretory endometrium is crowded by nature. So you have these corkscrew glands that can appear very close together. Here's a low power image. You can see that these glands are tightly packed, but as soon as you see that it's secretory, you can essentially, in most cases, ignore how crowded the glands look. 
and move on. Another thing is an artifact called telescoping. So sometimes you get uh, the endometrial gland sort of slides in on itself, and then when you cut through that area, you wind up with a little bit of tissue in the middle of the gland lumen. That's just sort of floating there, and it's not connected to the side. So at low power, it might look like there's crowding or architectural complexity in that area. But if you note, this tissue is just floating there, so you know it's not real. Another thing is endometrial polyps. You can get focal glandular crowding in polyps just by the nature of it being a polyp, and you should really not mistake that for hyperplasia unless it's a very diffuse uh, process. And lastly, endometrial stromal breakdown. So if you can imagine, you have breakdown of the stroma in between the glands. The glands can then sort of float close to each other, and they can appear crowded because they're just sitting there, but unless there is stroma in between, indicating that you have a solid piece of tissue, you can't really evaluate that area. So you need a solid piece of tissue to evaluate. You can't just evaluate floating glands. Let's move on now to atypical hyperplasia, or EIN. And I will define each of these separately, starting with atypical hyperplasia. So here you have, again, greater amount of endometrial glands, and you have stroma. And then you have cytologic atypia. So you have uh, increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. You have rounding up and loss of polarity in some nuclei. So you can see there are some nuclei toward the top here that are no longer really attached to the basement membrane. They're getting up toward the lumen of the gland instead of being nicely basally oriented like they're supposed to down here. Next, we'll talk about endometrioid intraepithelial neoplasia, or EIN. Here again, you have a greater amount of glands and you have stroma, and this simplifies the definition to cytologic demarcation from the background. So you no longer have to assess for atypia here, you just have to see glands that appear different from the background glands. So if I were to draw a line sort of down this area, you could see that the glands on the left side over here uh, look relatively bland. So these are really benign background proliferative glands. And then the glands uh, in this area here, like this gland, this gland here, you can see that they're, uh, they appear different from the background. So this cytologic demarcation is all you need to call this EIN. And again, if you looked at these glands at high power, they would meet the definition for atypical hyperplasia as well. There's a high degree of overlap between these two, but as I've just shown, the definition is slightly different. You also have a size criteria for EIN. So the definition is you need an area greater than one millimeter for this cytologic demarcation. So if you get one off gland that is crowded up to the other ones but looks slightly different, that's not quite enough to call this. And here's an example from low power. Whether you call this EIN or you call it atypical hyperplasia, you can sort of draw a line here and note that the glands toward the top of the screen look different from those at the bottom, which appear essentially benign, and very bland looking. So these glands at the top, you can see if you looked at high power, there would be atypia here, and you can see from low power that there's cytologic demarcation. So either using the EIN or the atypical hyperplasia classification, uh, this would meet the criteria for either. Sometimes you'll get a scenario like this where you have a fragment that has only atypical looking glands without really much background for you to compare to. And in those cases, you're going to have to take a closer look at the cytologic features, or you can compare to normal looking background glands on other fragments in the same slide. When you look at higher power, again, you see those features of atypia, which I mentioned earlier, and you can compare them to these normal proliferative glands that I show on the right here. And again, you have rounding up of some cells, you have loss of polarity, so you have some cells floating off towards the surface. And again, remember, these are uh, atypical proliferative lesions, so you should be able to find mitoses in here as you look around as well. Now, before I mentioned you can have focal areas of glandular crowding within an endometrial polyp, but here you have too much. So you see this area in the middle that is all really crowded glands, and even from low power, they look a bit revved up. So you want to take a look at this at higher power and see what's going on. And when you do look at higher power, you can see that there is demarcation here from background glands, which appear normal. So this already meets EIN criteria, and then if you look at each individual gland, you can see cytologic atypia here. So again, either definition you use, here you would have EIN or atypical hyperplasia arising in a polyp.
Now, atypical hyperplasia, or EIN, is associated with a greatly increased risk of carcinoma. In fact, about 20 to 40 percent of these patients will have concurrent adenocarcinoma, which will be found on subsequent hysterectomy. And most of these patients do go on to get a hysterectomy, uh, although in some cases, if a patient is young and still desires childbearing, progestins can be tried, and sometimes these will resolve with progestin therapy. Moving on now to endometrioid adenocarcinoma. And with the distinction between carcinoma and EIN, or atypical hyperplasia, it's really all about architecture. So with carcinoma, you're going to have confluent or back-to-back -back glands without any stroma in between. So they're really getting crowded one step above what you'd see in EIN or atypical hyperplasia. You can also see complex architecture in the way of cribriforming, papillary areas, or solid areas. And we'll talk about each of these in turn. And here we have an example of endometrioid adenocarcinoma arising in a background of EIN or atypical hyperplasia. You can see the demarcation line right about here, and the glands toward the bottom represent EIN, or atypical hyperplasia. And then towards the top, you have areas where you're starting to get confluent growth. So you have areas like this where the glands are just growing together with little to no intervening stroma at all. And you're also starting to get some cribriform spaces here, which I'll talk about in more detail in just a moment. Here's a higher power view of a cribriform space. So cribriform really means sieve-like. So here you have one glandular space, essentially. And within that glandular space, you have epithelium separating multiple lumens, like here, like here. So you start to get this look that resembles a sieve. So this is what we are talking about when we say cribriforming. And this is a type of architectural complexity that should push you towards calling carcinoma. Another term I've used to describe the architectural complexity you see in endometrial adenocarcinoma is maze-like growth. So if you look here, you don't really have any cribriforming per se, but you do have this really complex branching pattern of these glands. And each gland space, each branch is getting right up next to the other one with basically you know, no intervening endometrial stroma here. So this is another thing that would qualify for endometrioid adenocarcinoma. Here we have an area of papillary growth. So in some cases you get these really long villiform or finger-like papillae lined by glandular cells, and this counts as architectural complexity as well, so this can push you to carcinoma. And here finally we have areas of solid growth. So you can see there are clearly, in some areas uh, here, glandular spaces like here and here. But in other areas, like in these areas, you have just a solid growth of glandular cells not really forming discrete glands. Uh, this counts as solid growth. So this counts as architectural complexity that would push you to carcinoma. And it's also used in the grading system for endometrioid adenocarcinomas, as we'll discuss in another session. Now, the important thing about solid growth is that you should distinguish it from squamous morular metaplasia. So we talked a little bit about this last time. Squamous morular metaplasia is most often seen in cases of EIN or atypical hyperplasia or endometrioid adenocarcinoma. And it's a type of squamous metaplasia where you form these little balls of non-keratinizing, usually, squamous cells. And the thing is, you can't count squamous morular metaplasia as part of your architectural complexity. So here we would not count this area that I've circled, for example, as solid growth because these are not glandular cells. And you would also not count it as merging. So this gland here at the top, you know, you would not count it as merging with this gland at the bottom because what's connecting them is just squamous morular metaplasia. So everything you see in this slide is still okay for atypical hyperplasia or EIN. It would not meet the definition of carcinoma. Endometrioid adenocarcinoma, of course, typically requires definitive therapy with hysterectomy with or without staging. In some rare cases, if a patient is young and still desires childbearing, uh, sometimes a trial of progestin therapy can be used. And in rare cases, you can have regression of FIGO1 carcinomas with progestin therapy, although this is typically not um, the preferred method, especially in patients who are completed their childbearing. I have a lot more to say about endometrioid adenocarcinomas and other carcinomas that can arise in the endometrium, but we'll save that for a future video.
Thanks for joining us today. I hope you found this session useful. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out either in the comments below or on Twitter. I have a few more educational sessions planned, but if you have specific topics you'd like to discuss, feel free to leave those below, and I'll try to get to those at some point. Thanks again.